Hello, Jerupidus here to welcome you back to my walkthrough of Final Fantasy VI. In the last episode, we explored the southern continent, a place where every town is very much under the Empire's thumb. We then made our way to Vector, the capital of the Empire, where we infiltrated the Magitek Research Facility, hoping to rescue Ramu's fellow espers, but they were too far gone to offer any help aside from their magicite. After the espers gave us their power, Kefka appeared, and assuming Celeste was working as a spy, ordered her to hand over the magicite, which caused Locke to doubt her, if only momentarily. Celeste used her magic to transport Kefka and his goons away from the party, giving us a window to escape, and that's exactly what we're going to do. However, we did just get a bunch of new magicite, so let's take the opportunity to check it out and talk a little about the summons, which I haven't really mentioned so far. We've summoned Ramu, which is a Bolt 2 level effect, and Kirin, which will cast regen on the whole party, but let's get into what the others do. So obviously not all of our espers are new, so I'm not going to go over the spells of the ones we already know, but I will go over their summons. And it does helpfully tell you what the summon does up top, but I want to tell you the names because I may never end up casting them. So for Siren, that's going to be Hope Song, which would mute all the enemies. For Stray, that's going to be Cat Rain, which would confuse all enemies. Ifrit's going to do Inferno, and that's going to be a Fire 2 level effect. Shiva will do Gem Dust, which is an Ice 2 level effect. Unicorn will cast Remedy on the whole party via his Heal Horn summon, and he teaches you Cure 2 at a very fast rate, Remedy, Dispel, Safe, and Shell, all of which are pretty good spells. Maudwin is probably the best one here. His Chaos Wing is a non-elemental level 2 spell, so to speak, if that makes sense, and he will teach you Fire 2, Ice 2, and Bolt 2, making him a very good Esper, but on top of that, he will give you plus 1 magic power at level up, so he is just fantastic. Moving on, Shote is an instant death one, so it does give you plus 10% HP at level up and teaches you Bio Break and Doom, and when you cast him, he will do Demon Eye, which will petrify all of your enemies. I don't really like instant death spells because they rarely work, but they're kind of cool nonetheless, and Doom is obviously associated with the Invis Doom glitch, so it is a really powerful spell in this game, that is for sure. Moving on, we've got Phantom, which is our first Esper that will give us a bonus to MP on level up, and he will teach you Berserk, Vanish, and Demi. Those are all medium useful, but his Fader Summon will cast Invis on the whole party, which is pretty useful. Carbuncle does Ruby Power, which will cast Reflect on the whole party, and teaches you Reflect, Haste, Shell, Safe, and Warp, all of which are pretty good. It's a pretty good Esper, but unfortunately it doesn't give you any level up bonus. And finally, we have Bismarck, which will do Sea Song, giving you access to an all-enemy damaging water elemental attack. It will teach you basic magic, fire, ice, bolt, and life, and give you plus two vigor at level up, which is pretty sweet. And we're going to want Bismarck on someone, because it's going to be relevant coming up soon. And I feel like we should fiddle with Espers a little bit. Like, eh. Let's go Modwin. Same magic power bonus for Sabin, but useful spells, so let's go ahead and do that. And what about you, Locke? You're working on Kirin? Yeah, we can stick with that. The thing about the upcoming section is that we won't actually get that many magic points, so switching espers doesn't mean we're going to learn any new spells, so I think we'll just leave it where it is. And speaking of the upcoming section, if you think I've been chewing your ear off, just hold on. <laughs> so... In this upcoming section, there are two different enemies. There's the purple mag rotor and the red mag rotor. And the way it works is that it feels random, but it actually is not. The seed for how the battles is going to play out happens as soon as you hit the bottom of the elevator. Now, we can affect that in a minor way by putting Sabin in the front row. That's going to change the encounters we want, and you can only encounter the red mag rotor here. So, if you don't end up meeting it, you have to come back and just resetting the game won't be enough. You'll have to fiddle with your party configuration. If you've done everything exactly as I have done, switching Sap into the front row will do it, but you can also mess with it by casting Imp on someone, things like that. And we don't want to miss this encounter because we do want to have every single rage available to Gao, despite the fact that we're not going to get them all. Now, <laughs> let's go ahead and talk to Sid. Sid says Celeste. I've known her since she was a baby. I've raised her as if she was my own daughter. But she was forced to become a Magitek Knight and has done some awful things. If I could only talk to her, I'd apologize for the way her life has turned out. No, it's Kefka! Go! And he pushes us into the minecart. And now this scene is the rare instance in this game where I think their ambition got away with them. It doesn't look good. <laughs> But let's talk about the Mag Rotor anyway. So the purple one is going to be weak to fire. And we just nailed the Rare Steel there, which is a Bolt Edge, and the Common Seal would be a Shuriken. And all of the Mag Rotors are going to have nice steals that are going to be useful for Shadow later. And one-eighth of the time from the purple Mag Rotor, you can win a Water Edge. 
now, if things work out the way I think so, we're gonna get a red mag router in this encounter. And there they are, look at that. Now, I'm not gonna waste time trying to steal from all of them, I'm just gonna take them all out with Sabin. Because I don't want to mess around in these fights for too long, but these guys are weak to ice, and they have a shuriken as a common steal, and a bolt edge as a rare steal, and you can win a fire scheme one-eighth of the time as well. I think maybe in post I might try throwing, like, some scan lines on this to see if that makes it look better, but it didn't look good when this game came out, and it doesn't look good now. I don't really know what they were thinking, but they did their best. Obviously, they had technical limitations to contend with, However unfortunate it may have worked out. I would have liked something better, like it being animated the way it looked when Sid pushed us into the minecart. This is just a big yikes, to be honest. <laughs> At least we have the soundtrack to make up for it. And you know what, since we've got some time to kill while we're taking this minecart ride, why don't I throw the scan lines back up and you can let me know how you think it looks in the comments. Alright, just nailing rare steals. I like that. Having a few extra throwing items for Shadow is gonna be sweet, especially without having paid for any of them. And I may have mentioned it already, but I have really, really come around on steel quite a bit. Like, we have absolute mountains of items that we've stolen. It's pretty incredible. And when you're wearing the sneak ring, you succeed almost every single time. Like, the only time you get a couldn't steal prompt is when an enemy is only holding a rare steal. It's been pretty awesome. All right, one more encounter with those sweet, sweet red mag rotors. But these guys, unfortunately, are just another example of what makes filling out Gao's rage list so miserable. You wouldn't even know they were here. You can go through this whole thing just meeting the purple ones and have no idea the red ones can appear. And even if you know they can appear, you might not know how to affect the RNG to actually get it to happen once you get to the bottom of that elevator. It's the worst. But here is the boss number 128. Let me tell you a little bit about this guy. He's got 3,276 HP, and he absorbs ice elemental attacks, of which I don't think we can cast any. But if we could, we wouldn't want to. He's got a rare steal of a Tempest Sword, which is a sweet sword for Cyan, which will replace his attack with Wind Slash 50% of the time. Which is unlike other similar weapons, like Sabin's Fire Knuckle, for example, that will proc the spell in addition to the attack. The Tempest, which we just succeeded stealing there, which is kind of incredible to me, <laughs> will actually replace the attack. But it is still very good. It will damage all enemies with Wind Elemental, so it's, it's a good one. And I'm glad that we managed to succeed this early in the fight. Now, Number 128 has a special property to him where if you end up killing both of those arms at the same time with the same attack, he will go crazy. He will haste himself and start casting Gale Cut, which is a Wind Elemental attack, Atomic Ray, which is Fire Elemental and stronger than Fire 2, and Shockwave, which is just like a physical attack but magic damage, and Net, which can inflict stop. So you'd really like to not do that, but fortunately, the right arm has a little bit less HP than the left arm. As you can sort of tell by their relative sizes to each other, the right arm is a little bit smaller than the left arm. So using Fire Dance isn't going to kill both of them at the same time, and that is to our benefit for sure. Usually when I do this fight, I end up having to sit here for a very long time trying to get that Steel to succeed. So I feel like Steel heard me talking about it and just decided to reward me for my compliments. But down he goes, not so tough at all. Let's get out of here. At a very leisurely pace, I might add. Obviously, we don't have our sprint shoes on, but that's okay. I want my relics to be battle -like. And I was hoping to get in at least one encounter so I can talk about the chaser a little bit. So this is one of two chaser encounters that you can get. When he's alone, when he dies, he's going to summon the trappers. And he can also appear alongside pipsqueaks, where if you kill all the pipsqueaks but the chaser is left, he will resummon the pipsqueaks. Chaser is weak to Bolt and uses Plasma, which is a lightning elemental attack right there. 
and it does a boatload of damage, 443, wow. He's also got a Bio Blaster as a common steal and can be a little bit of a pain as you can see there. Now here come the Trappers. These guys are gonna have an Auto Crossbow as a rare steal and they can lead with level five Doom, which can wipe you if you're level 15 or 20. How it works is it will succeed if your level is divisible by five. And here they go. I think they're all gonna fire them off then. Which doesn't really make a ton of sense to me because if one of them works, then you're all just dead. Casting this more than once doesn't really do anything extra, but this can be a surprise party wipe, which is deeply unfortunate. To the game's credit, they give you a save point right before you end up in these encounters, but it can certainly be a nasty surprise if you're unprepared. And I'm honestly pretty happy with Edgar having survived that fight. He was in trouble. Yikes. All right, let's go ahead and top up after that. That should be good. And you know what? Let's fire off a gear spell. All right, let's keep going. Setzer comes running up. I was starting to worry. Setzer goes, Ugh, what's up with Celeste? The lock doesn't reply. Probably a bit embarrassed. Sensor says, we'll talk later. Let's get out of here. Here comes Kefka. Crud, what a mess. I don't think so. You won't get away. says, let's not overstay our visit. We're out of here on the double. Setzer says, right. Speaking of which, maybe we should be leaving. Edgar says, something horrible's coming. Yep, that's right. Something wicked this way comes. And Savin's been hanging out with Gao too much. He says, wow, what in the... And now I'm gonna explain right now, we're gonna do a little bit of a sneaky this fight. So let's check it out. We're going to execute a little glitch called Joker Doom. I'll explain how this fight is supposed to work in a little bit. And believe me, we are going to actually do this the way it's meant to be done. This is a little bit too far outside the bounds of a walkthrough for me, but I'm gonna show it anyway because I know about it. So by using an echo screen right now, we're going to get to manipulate the RNG to allow something that shouldn't be possible to happen. So once we allow the animation of this to finish, we can pull up sensor slots. And now I'm going to quickly pause right below the seven. And now we have a lot of leeway to get the other sevens, and you're not supposed to be able to do this during boss fights, but because of the echo screen resetting the RNG, we will be able to. Now we have a lot of leeway here because we hit the first seven, so let's time it out. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Boom. And this allows us to cast Joker Doom on a boss and win instantaneously. <laughs> but I'll see you back at the beginning of the fight where we'll play this normally. All right, so after cheesing this fight, let's talk about how it's actually supposed to work. So each crane is based on an element, left being thunder-based and right being fire-based. If you attack them with the element they absorb, they will charge up and they will charge each other after every three attacks. Once they reach three charges, they will attack with either Gigabolt or Fire 3, which as you may imagine, is absolutely devastating. <laughs> So the left crane has 1800 HP and is weak to water and absorbs bolt, and the right crane has 2300 HP and is weak to water and bolt but absorbs fire. Them both being weak to water is the reason we decided to get the Bismarck summon on someone because that ends up working to great effect. Setzer, outside of Joker Doom, is pretty useless in this fight, but we'll try and hit his slots without cheating too much. But we will do our best to take advantage of the weaknesses and just beat these guys the old fashioned way.
Oh, and I hit on the airship one. But unfortunately, it died before I could get it. All right, and down they go the old-fashioned way. And we're out of here. Lock says, I'm worried about Terra. Let's return to Zozo. Setzer says, Terra? Who's that? And that's right. Once again, Setzer hasn't met Terra, which is so easy to forget. Lock says, I'll explain on the way about Terra, Espers, the Returners. Setzer has a lot of catching up to do. says Terra. Magicite. Terra says, Father? I remember it all. I was raised in the Esper's world. The Esper world. Now it's not clear how Tara's remembering this because a lot of this stuff happened before she was born, but anyway. Emergency, something's coming through the gate. And we'll go check that out, but first let's go talk to everyone. Fairy says, you're the gatekeeper, Modwin? And yes, apparently I am, and I'm not very good at it because I'm nowhere near it. Strong winds. Be careful, Modwin. The Elder says, this evening is an ill omen. You okay, Modwin? We're just about ready to go check out the gate, but first we're going to pop over here, just to show that there's nothing in here. It is a little frustrating that you can't get to that pot, but there's probably nothing in it. There's nothing in any of the pots in here. And one last place to go is right in here. And this one asks if we're okay as well. Alright, let's get back to work, <laughs> guarding the gate and get over there. Modwin says, listen well and think clearly. What will we do? We will return together, of course. This is a false choice. We can't just leave her here. She's pretty weak. Better let her rest for a moment. And that's what we'll do. Let's talk to everyone again. Elder says, did I hear there was a human here? And Modwin replies, probably wandered in here by mistake. And this one says, you'd better do away with it. Humans and espers are incompatible. Now, I think that where espers are coming from is a little bit understandable, but it's interesting to me that they're not perfect, right? They're biased against humans. For good reason, but they are still biased. The link between worlds has surely weakened over the past 1,000 years. And this one says, everyone here's feeling uneasy. And yep, that's because of the human. This one has nothing to say. This one says, they say a human girl's here. And whoever they is, is right. Elder's orders, no one passes through the gate. Well, we're not going that way then. This one asks, do you even know what you've done? And no, Modwin does not actually know what he's done. The fairy asks, why has this happened now after all these years? 
That's a good question. I guess sometimes things just happen for no reason at all, right? But now that we've finished talking to everyone, let's go back. And talk to the woman. Maudwin says, did I awaken you? And the girl says, you're an Esper? What's that pendant for? And Maudwin says, it's yours now. It helps protect the Esper world. The girl replies, Esper world? Boy, did I take the low road or what? <laughs> it is hard to imagine how lost you must have been to end up here. Modwin says, the Esper folk are pretty upset, you being a human and all. The girl replies, you the one who saved me? And Modwin finally introduces himself. I am Modwin. I tired of living in the human world. That world is filled with desire, greed, and loathing. It's highly infectious. Modwin says, are humans and Espers truly so different? The woman, who now is named Madonna, says, So, I'm an example of the evil in this world, huh? And Maudwin says, No, I mean... And Madonna replies, I'll return to my world tomorrow. And Maudwin says, You'll need a guide. And the Elder is watching this with some amount of concern. And we awaken the next day, and she's gone. The Elder says, Everything alright? What? The human's gone? And that's right, she sure is. This fairy says a human girl made it all the way to the gate. And this one says that this generation of humans knew about our abilities, and they decided they wanted to utilize our powers, it would be a total disaster. And this youth says, what's wrong, Modwin? And what's wrong is the lady's missing, so let's go look for her. Modwin says, if you don't want to return to your world, you may stay here. And Madonna replies, but humans and espers can never coexist. And Modwin says, how do we know for sure unless we observe for ourselves? How do we know? Unless we... for ourselves. And this could be described as a very artistic sex scene, in a way, but I'd like to think of it as just the blossoming of their relationship, which then results in this baby. And Modwin says we've given her a name, and Madonna asks him, what? It's Tara. Not bad, huh? Two years later, and this does not look good. Humans, the nexus between our worlds has opened again. The wind, so odd, just like two years ago. But something's different now. Troops have come seeking our magical power. Blast it, they've made it as far as the Elder's house. Look, it's Emperor Gestal. He says, Aha! We finally found it! Those ancient writings told us of this world and described the awesome magical properties of these beasts. Grab them! Riches to any man who captures an Esper! Go! Madonna says, Terra's alright. We've got to do something about this. Soon the humans will arrive. It seems like they're already here. And the fairy says it's dangerous out there, so let's talk to the Elder. The Elder says we've no choice. We must do what we've been avoiding. Modwin says, you mean the magic barrier? And the Elder says, here's the plan. We'll cause a tempest that'll sweep all the nasty creatures out of our realm. Then we'll seal the gate. I'm the last of our kind able to cast this magical seal. Modwin says, but in your state, you might just... And the Elder says, pass away, but at least we will finally be safe. Modwin says, Madonna. And Madonna says, I, for one, will not miss the other side.
The Elder says, let's do it. We have no other choice. All right, and no one has anything new to say. So, let's talk to the fairy. And the Esper behind us says, this is all because of that human girl. Maudwin replies, nonsense. The Esper says, I'm sure she helped the others find us. Maudwin says, get a grip on yourself, but Madonna can hear them. The Esper says, no, she's one of them. Soon she'll be wearing our hide. And understandably is very upset by this, and maybe is thinking staying here permanently is not a good idea if everyone thinks that she led the soldiers here. Maudwin says, ugh. Madonna took Terra to the gate. She sure did. Let's go chase after her. The Elder says, where are you going? Ugh. And Maudwin says, Madonna's getting drawn into the next world. The Elder says, impossible. It's too late. I've already begun casting the barrier. There's no turning back. Maudwin says, that fool. And this is a bit of a foolish thing to do. The soldier says, look what popped out. And here comes the Tempest. Gestalt screams, just when we were in reach of a veritable bonanza. Modwin, I'm not their friend. Modwin says, I understand that. Madonna says, thank you. And Modwin says, can you make it back here? Madonna says, sure, but... She loses the baby. Tara! And of course, let's go to chase after the baby. And Modwin cries after her, Madonna! And they both end up outside the gate. Gestahl says, a human girl? Well... Who is she? And Madonna says, please, take care of my baby. And this is maybe the most monstrous scene in a game with a lot of monstrous scenes. We know that Kefka's a monster, but the Emperor is no better. Gestahl says, your girl? Uh, hmm, then she's half human and half... How absolutely fascinating. Gestahl says, mwahaha, she will help us realize our dream faster than we ever imagined. Madonna says, no, and Gestahl says, quiet, my dear. And he punches her to the ground. We will own this world. Ha ha ha. Yep, the Emperor is also a total monster. Ugh. says, that was my father? I'm the product of an Esper and a human. That's where I got my powers. Now I understand. I finally feel I can begin to control this power of mine. Edgar says, so Gestahl must have known the secret of the Esper's power back then. And Locke replies, and those Espers at the facility were grabbed during that expedition. That means Celeste's power came at the expense of an Esper, and we already kind of knew that, but yeah, that's pretty rough. Sabin says they can't get away with this. We have to strike back. Terra says, what's happening in Narsh? And Locke says, hmm, maybe we should head back that way. And Setzer says, the airship's ready. Terra says, come on. Sensor says, by all means, take a turn at the wheel, and we're about to get a little tutorial on how to use the airship. Operating instructions. Control pad, left and right is direction, up and down is altitude. Press the A button to move forward, press the X button to go amidships. There you can change your party or purchase items. Press the B button to land, press the A button to lift off. 
All right, and yes it is. Shall I teach you a technique too? And let's tell him yes. Press the start button to view the world map. Hold the Y button down and use the control pad to move in all directions. And that way you can sort of stray for a move without turning. Use the L and R buttons with the control pad for high speed turns. And let's head to Narsh. We finally, finally have control of the airship and we can go wherever we want. And the first place we're going to go is the very first place we ever went in the game. <laughs> And we will check out what's happening at Narsh, but that's going to have to wait until next time because I'm all out of time for today. So thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next Final Fantasy Friday.